So God told Moses to build him a dwelling place. And if you're in the building and you look at the floor, you can see we've kind of taken a more literal approach to this. As you, um, No matter where you're sitting in the sanctuary, you can look down and the blue tape runs all the way back to the back wall. And um, these are the dimensions of the two first two areas of the tabernacle. And this tabernacle was specifically supposed to be a place where um, people were to meet God and where God said he was going to meet the people. He gave them very detailed instructions on how to do this. He asked them to give of themselves, both their, mon their monetary and of their time. And not only gave them a design for the structure, he also gave them a design for all of the furnishings that's supposed to go into it. Every single one of them. And well, when you start thinking about it, I have an interesting question for you. Where are the chairs? If you've read through Exodus, you, you come to the conclusion that God told them all these things to put in the tabernacle, and he didn't design one single solitary chair. By the way, you guys are extremely lucky, those in the building today, that these pews are attached to the floor, because if this had been chairs, this sanctuary would be empty today. And trust me, I thought about taking a screwdriver and taking them loose and setting the pews up on the side and clearing the middle here, because guess what? In the tabernacle... There was no sitting allowed. I'm sure the priest um, had a very interesting job. He never had to tell his spouse how his day went. As he came home, it was all over his clothes, literally. His sandals, as he walked to and from the tabernacle, probably went stick, stick, stick from the dry blood that was plastered on the bottom. When he did come home, he reeked of the smell of um, burnt animal flesh and sweet incense. He probably came in and plopped into the first chair that he could find, only to have his wife tell him, get up and go take a shower before you get blood everywhere. There's no sitting allowed for you. He never had a moment's rest, and I often wonder if um, when he went to work the next day, if he was often tempted to just take a stool with him. Because God gave him nowhere to sit. And I want you to remember this because we think about the priest of the Old Testament, but remember I introduced you to this scripture last week as one that we know. And in the, the area that we're talking today, in the time we're talking, the priest today, well, here's how Peter defined him. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called out in the darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So in the New Testament theory, there is no such thing as a priest. The priesthood are those that are followers of Christ. So that means if you're here today and you're a follower of Christ, why are you sitting is all the work done? Not hardly. You see, this idea that God designed no chairs was very telling of how God viewed the relationship. Think about how busy these priests would have been. There's so much to do. There's lighting and tending of candles. I would have liked this. They got to play with fire on several different levels. So they got to, they had to light and, and, and burn candles. They had to burn incense. They had to do various sacrifices, offering prayer, Washing their hands and feet over and over and over. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. You don't realize how many times these guys had to wash their hands and feet just as they did their daily jobs. God never intended for this to be a watch and sit ministry. So I want you to think about this. Yesterday was a national holiday. Did you know that? I'm thinking uh, tomorrow's late. No, yesterday was a national holiday. You know what yesterday was? Not a holiday for me. Mine's coming next week. But the national holiday yesterday was the first full Sunday, the first full Saturday of college football. And there were many thousands of people across the United States that piled into stadiums. And if you couldn't make it to a stadium, you set up your little popcorn and your, and your soda and everything. You got in front of the television. And, and that's where you spent your Saturday. And you realized what you were doing. You were consuming football. 
Now, you weren't playing football. That would have required you to get the ball, maybe get some pads or something, to go out into the side yard and actually do something. But you were consuming football. And when it comes to God, unfortunately, we think the same way. We're supposed to come in, find our seat, get comfortable, grab a snack, get a cup of coffee, and Barry, just feed me. I just want to consume God. But in the tabernacle, the amazing thing is, as you walk through this, everything had a purpose. And as you walk from piece to piece to piece, furnishing to furnishing to furnishing, nothing was to be consumed. It was all to be experienced. There was something to do with every single stop. And I often wonder, what would happen if we designed our worship that way? What if you came in one Sunday and over here there was a little place for you to stop and pray? And then the next place you came to, there was a place for you to maybe sing some songs on your own. And then the next place to, you had to come to, there was a place for you to study the Bible on your own. And the next place there was a place to do communion. Maybe there was a couple of different song stands. You've got to sing more than one song, right? What if we did worship that way? Where it wasn't something you came and you sit and consume, but it was something where you had to come and experience it. I wonder how many people would decide, you know what, that's a little too weird for me. I think I'm going to go down the street and find a building where I can just sit and consume God. We've missed the point of worship. God did not want us to consume him. He wanted us to experience him. How do I know? Well, because we've been walking through his design worship facility. And remember, we started in the Holy of Holies, so that's the big blue tape area that goes from the stage right to the first pew. Um, so that's the Holy of Holies, and there was one piece of furniture sitting in it, and that was the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on top of it. And as we moved out, now we're into the holy place, which kind of runs from the front pew all the way back to the back wall, 15 feet wide by 30 feet deep. And last week we put our very first... Um, piece of furniture in that, and that was the altar of incense, and it was the place where they were supposed to stop. Every time they came into the Holy of Holies, they were supposed to stop and offer on that altar, supposed to offer their confessions, their prayers, their praises, everything, that was where they were supposed to stop. So we're moving on, and there are two other pieces today, and today we're going to move on to the table. Now, not the communion table. Um, This was called the table of showbread. And this is how God described it. This is how God gave him the design to build it. I'm in Exodus chapter 25, verses 23 through 29. Make a table of archaea wood, two cubits long, a cubic wide, and a cubic and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make gold molding around it. Also, make around it a rim, a hand breadth wide, and put gold molding around the rim. Make four gold rings for the table and fasten them to the four corners where the four legs are. The rings will be closed on the will be close will be close to the rim and to hold the poles used to carry the table within them. And make its plates, dishes of pure gold, as well as its pitchers, bowls, and pour for the pouring out of offerings. Put the bread of put, put the bread of the presence of the table before me at all times. So God wants a table. And well, the dimensions of this table, well, it's a lot like this. So I'm going to hold this up. This is why I made mine out of plastic, no poles. I can lift these very easily. So this is about the dimensions of the table that God has asked for. It's about 36 inches this way by about eight, by 18 inches this way, and it's 27 inches high if you go by a cubic being 18 inches. Its appearance, well, it was about the shape of what we would call a coffee table. Maybe just a little bit higher. So this would be the thing that yesterday when you were watching football, that you had it in front of your couch, and this is where you put your popcorn and your drinks. That's kind of the table that we're thinking about here. Um, it's about that size. And like all the other tabernacle pieces, except for the ark itself, it was um, wood covered with gold. It had those familiar corner loop hooks, which um, meant this was to be carried, not put on a cart. And the table was matched with a matching was made with a matching set of bowls, plates, and a pitcher. We'll talk about those in just a minute. But what I do want you to see is that this particular table had an on-the-go meal. This thing was to go. This is what it says: put the bread of the pre- put the bread on the presence of this table to me before me at all times. So the bread was never supposed to leave the table except 
when it was to be replaced by fresh bread. Hmm, that's an interesting idea. So they just kind of left it laying out there for an entire week. This means that during transport, they had to go about and find a way to, to put that, that, that bread so it wouldn't fall off. Because even when they moved it, guess what it says in Numbers chapter 4, verses 7 through 8? Over the table in the presence of the Lord, they spread a blue tablecloth. Oh, I'm missing something. Just a minute. We want to be authentic, right? So, so here we go. The blue tablecloth. There we go. Okay. So, over the present, I spread a blue tablecloth and put on it plates and dishes and bowls and all the jars for drink offerings. And the bread is continually be there and remain on it. They spread. And then they are to spread a scarlet cloth over them to cover them when the, with durable leather and put the poles in place. So, before they set the table, they were to put a blue tablecloth on it. And then once they, were, once they were ready to move it, they would put a scarlet one over it and cover it with the leather because this thing had to always be on the move. So they had to add an extra feature to it. They had to then come back, and it says, also make around it a rim about a hand breadth wide and put gold molding around the rim. So at the table, mine doesn't have this. Remember, this is me. I can't drive nails straight, okay? I cut the pipe. That's about, as all of, that's about as good as I get. But it would have had a small rim around it, which would have meant that as it covered up, they could take this thing, and the food was to stay in place the entire thing. How did I have that job of carrying that table? That means you had to carry it level so that nothing fell off, and they were always there ready to go. Um, it's a table, so its practical purpose is to hold stuff. Um, I want you to know something, though. There was nothing sacred about the table. It was a piece of furniture. The symbolism is what it was all about that made this particular piece of furniture special. And that's important to note. Because you know what? We have a lot of things that we associate with church. We do. We have a table over here that we're not going to use today. As a matter of fact, now, just a minute. This isn't our table today. This table is not a table that we're going to use for our worship. So you know what? Let's just cover this today. I know I'm about to break like 50 bazillion church rolls here. But this is not the table for today. I don't want you focused on the table. At least not that one. Because guess what? We get real attached to things. And then when they get covered or they get moved, they get swapped out, we get upset because guess what? When I move the pieces in the church, then you understand I moved God. And all of a sudden we begin to worship the things that we use to worship God, and we forget who God is, and then we lose God. And you know, the funny thing is, even all these pieces God made for the tabernacle, none of them survived the test of time. You know why, don't you? Could you imagine if some church had the actual original table of showbread? Everybody would want to come to that church to eat off of God's table, right? We would start worshiping the table. Could you imagine if a church had the Ark of the Covenant? First of all, they would have a very good investment piece that's made of solid gold on the top. But you understand what would happen, right? We would come and want to worship the ark. We get so attached to things that we forget. The furniture meant nothing. It was the symbolism God wrapped around all of these pieces that made it special. Now, while we would think of this as a coffee table or an accent table, really what this table of showbread was, well, it was an intimate dinner table. Kind of small. It was a place built for dinner for two and God even made sure it would be romantic because it was going to be a candlelit dinner for two. That's what this table was. This table was a place where they were supposed to come and have a meal. It was all about setting the table. This is what it says. Take the finest flour and bake 12 loaves of bread using two-tenths of an ephod of, on each loaf, arranging them in two stacks, six on each stack. On the table of pure gold before the Lord, by each stack put some pure incense and a memorial portion to represent the bread to be, a, to be a food offering presented to the Lord. This bread is to be set out before the Lord regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath, on behalf of the Israelites as a lasting covenant. It belongs to Aaron and his sons who are to eat it in the sanctuary area because it's the most holy, part of the perpetual, most holy part of their perpetual share of the food offering presented to the Lord. So, this table is supposed to be a dinner table. Now, that means we need some things, right? Because it's not about the table. It's about setting up for a meal. 
So let's talk about the things that we need to set this table this morning. The first thing that, that we're going to need, there we go. I'm sorry, I was supposed to put that up there so y'all could, y'all, could, y'all could read that along with me. First thing that we need is we're going to need some bowls. Good news, I have some stuff with me. I know, I'm breaking all kind of rules this morning, but that's okay. Here we go. First thing we need, we need some bowls on our table. Not the plates, we have to start with the bowls. And these bowls, well, these bowls were very special because they were be filled with frankincense. The exact same frankincense that is on the altar of incense. So you get what God is doing here, right? The first thing that goes on are the bowls, and it has this, the same thing that they're offering to there on those prayers. So you get what they're putting on this table first. What? A couple bowls of prayer. It says we're supposed to have two, one for each of the, one for each of the, the stacks. It goes with each stack of bread. And so this bowl of prayer was to be placed there on the altar. You know, I, I think about this kind of when we put bowls on the table, we think about salad. It's the thing that you usually consume before you consume the main dish, right? Hmm. Does that mean maybe as I come to this table and I'm going to meet God for dinner, the first thing I should be thinking about is prayer. So we go from there, and it says that um, we need a pitcher. Exodus chapter 37, verse 6, 6. And, then, and they made a pitcher of pure gold, the articles from the table, its plates and dishes and bowls, the, its pitcher for pouring out of a drink offering. So I need a pitcher. By the way, mine are not pure gold. I didn't have the budget. I'm sorry, but, but that's okay. So, so they had a pitcher, and that pitcher was to be placed there on the table. But it says it's supposed to be used for a drink offering. Do you know what a drink offering is? A drink offering we actually find over there in Numbers chapter 15, verse 5. It says, with each lamb for, uh, for the burnt offering of sacrifice, prepare a quarter hen of wine as a drink offering. So a drink offering had two things in common. Thing number one, it was always wine. Thing number two, when they were done with it, they didn't drink it. They poured it onto the altar. By the way, mine is the non-alcoholic version of wine. We call it grape juice. Um, But but you, you get what's going on here. So they say, hey, put the pitcher and fill it full of wine, and we're going to use this for a drink offering later on. So what else do we need? Well, um, it says we're supposed to have some plates. Now, once still on the table, the bread was supposed to be left there until it was changed out. Well, to get that, that, those bread, those, that bread from the um, fire to the table, well, there was a ceremony that went with this, and this was a big deal. This would have been like what we see today over in Arlington that once a year when they place the wreath on the, on, the, on the cemetery, there's this great big pageantry. You understand when it was time to change out the soap bread, it would have been like a parade because what would have happened is they would have, they would have gotten the fresh bread from the fire made that morning and they would have formed a line of the priests and the priests would have formed a line and all of the priests together would have crammed into this holy place. It was the only time that they were all in the holy place together. And there they would have come, and then they would have taken the bread that was on the table, and they would have divided it up amongst the priests. Huh, this is going to be kind of familiar, isn't it? They would have divided it up amongst the priests, and they would have consumed it, maybe even sprinkling some of this frankincense on the bread as they go. And then they would have placed the fresh bread on the table. Well, to get that bread from the um, fire to the table, they would have had some kind of a gold plate like a like a dish and they would have brought it in on a plate holding it like this because it would have been hot they took it right out the oven i could be a priest of the old testament seriously i mean meals made of bread yeah this would have been perfect for me so so they would have had these plates but this wouldn't have actually gone on the table um this would have actually been used to carry it in there you see see this is why you practice stuff before you do it um these plates would have been used to transport the loaves from the fire to the table and so now we need dishes. And their dishes would have been interesting. Um, there would have been two of them. And they would have placed them like that. And I, I want you to notice these dishes, okay, we call these pie pans, but they would have had some kind of edging on them. Why would they have had edging on them? Because uh, you've got to leave the table on. They've got to leave the, the things on there. The bread has got to stay at all times. 
They would have put those edges around it, and they probably would have had something. I started to use duct tape, but I thought that would be a little much. But they, they, they would have had something that would have fastened these plates to it because once the bread was there, it couldn't be removed. It was supposed to stay there until the next Sabbath, no matter what. Now, you also understand from Sabbath to Sabbath, that means that if they're going from place to place, that means even on the days they didn't set up the tabernacle, when the next Sabbath came and it was time for them to stop and celebrate Sabbath, the bread had to be changed. So the ceremony would have to be done, even without the tabernacle built around. This was a very special meal that's really all about the bread. And well, for the bread, there were 12 equal portions. So I don't know exactly what their bread looked like. Um, I started to go with um, white bread. That was the cheapest choice, but I decided I should at least have something with no leaven in it. So um, the other kind of bread was a little on the expensive side. So, so tortillas are pretty aff affordable, and there, there are no leaven in them. So there's one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then there would have been an equal stack, so there would have been six over here. And you understand why there's 12, right? There's one there for each of the tribe of Israel. Each of the tribe would have been represented in one of these loaves of bread. So there's three, four, five, six. So they would have had two portions of bread, and it would have been set out. And so here is the setting for this particular table. This bread, um, each was to may be made separately. Now, I, I don't know how you make bread. But in my house, when you're going to make biscuits, you make one big batch of dough, and then you divide the dough up. That's not how God told them to make this bread. They had to make each little section of dough in its own little bowl to make sure each bread was of equal portion. That's how God told them to do it. He gave them a specific baking instruction on how to make their bread. They um, contained no leaven, and they were made with refined flour. So this was a very special high maintenance bread that they were supposed to make. Refined flour, don't just take whatever you use. This is the stuff I want you to crush. It would have been made of whole grain, so I guess I should have brought whole wheat tortillas. But it would have been made of whole grain. Um, they were to remain on the table from Sabbath to Sabbath. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like bread after it starts to get a little bit stale. Um, but they would have sat there for an entire week, kind of out in the open, and they would have sat there on display. Now, it's funny, they call this the table of showbread, but think about it. When they put it into the tabernacle, it was all covered up, and then they put the tents around it, and then they uncovered it. But who's the only people that ever saw the bread? It would be the priest. If it wasn't for them, once it's on the table, the only people that ever got shown the bread would have been the priest. Everybody else would have had to watch them as they were coming in, and they just assumed that the priest was putting it where it was supposed to be. So this was kind of one of those things. Only the priest ever really got to see the bread. Um, at the start of the Sabbath, the priests would gather in the place of the Holy Holies and they would eat the bread. So they would have a fellowship meal to come together and consume this bread. Now, when they were done consuming the bread, you understand what they did with the wine, right? It was walked out and poured on the, burnt off, on the altar of burnt offering and then they replaced the wine as well. Interesting. All the way back at the beginning, before anybody ever thought about all the other things we think about, God prepares a table where we're going to break bread and pour wine. Wow. That's an impressive thought. A lot of times we tie the idea of communion to the Passover, which it is because Jesus was celebrating Passover. But you understand, this is the first meal. This is where God came into the idea of, hey, look, bread and wine. Um, the loaves would be placed on the table, and there they would stay. New loaves came in, and there they'd sit. Now, you get the effect, because if I'm, when I put this table in place, it's going to be about halfway back down amongst the pews, and they're going to sit there, and that meant every time that the priest came in to come in and offer in this area, they would have to walk past this table. And there they would see the bread and the wine. And they knew Sabbath was coming. And when Sabbath was coming, they would have to consume the bread and pour out the wine. On their way to prayer, they had to pass this very, very, very simple meal. Designed by who? This was God's design. It's not about the table. 
it's all about the bread. And guess what? That hasn't changed for us. It's still about the bread. This is what it says in John chapter 6, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. That's the picture. This bread, from week to week, had to be changed. Jesus called himself the bread of life. Somebody that was going to make sure that he came into your life and he was going to remove that spiritual hunger. He was going to fill that hole that was there. He goes on to tell us in John chapter 6, verse 47 through 51, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for your life and the world. It's an interesting idea. Jesus saw himself as the bread of life. He went so far as to say, you know what? People that ate of this meal, people that ate the man in the wilderness, people that, that came to this table, they're all dead. At the time Jesus came along, all of the people that, that participated in the tabernacle, they were all dead. But Jesus said, you know what? I got a new meal for you. And that meal is me. Not me buried. Jesus. That, that meal is for you to see who I am. To see that I am going to sacrifice my body for you. I am going to shed my blood for you. And you know what? If you allow this meal into your life, you never die. Physically, yes. But you will understand this relationship with Jesus goes far beyond that of the grave. It's this meal that Jesus is representing himself as. I am the bread of life. It's important for us to remember, because I think a lot of times when it comes to this, this thing of Jesus, we, 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 we look at it and it's kind of like, okay, I got Jesus, and yeah, Jesus is important, and I like Jesus, and I love Jesus, and I come here on Sunday morning, and I sing about Jesus. Is he part of your life? When you leave here this morning, do you leave Jesus on the table? When you leave here this morning, did you just come here and you had a really great service or, a, I guess, an adequate sermon that you consumed and then you left? And you're going to be back next week, just like the Israelites of old when they went from what? Sabbath to Sabbath. Isn't it interesting? Jesus says, I'm not interested in just being your Sabbath. I'm interested in being your life. I'm not interested in you coming to me one time a week. I'm interested in you coming to me with all that you have, with all of your problems, with all of your issues, and all of your brokenness. I am interested in being a daily part of your life. But let's face it, we've kind of rearranged the way God has, we want God to do things. What do we want? It's kind of funny. We, we want the Old Testament model. You know how that works, right? I come, I consume and I go. And then I come back, and I come, and I do, and I go. And the time in between, that's my time. Jesus had his, and this is mine. But Jesus says, you know what? This table is a table built for two. You and God. Now, the funny thing, um, over in Corinthians, Paul brings this kind of into the modern-day church area era. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 through 28. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was portrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. On the night Jesus died, he um, gave us another simple meal. We celebrate it sort of like this. But do you notice? It's the same two emblems. It's the same thing. It's still bread and juice, bread and wine. But Jesus gives them a new meaning. He said, hey, look, this bread, yeah, I know you remember all the days at the table of showbread. I know you remember Passover. I know, but the next time you look at this bread, think about my body that's going to get broken for you. And, and juice, wine, it was a part of their culture. There was wine everywhere. It was every movie, at every meal. It was kind of like soda pop for me. Everywhere you went, there was always wine there. And Jesus said, when you see that, I want you to remember. That's like the blood I spilled for you to establish this relationship. This dinner built for two. Now, here's the funny thing. In Leviticus chapter 22, um, it talks about the priests as they came in. And for a priest, for some, excuse me, for the people to come in and, and participate in this showbread meal, and there were only two qualifications for coming in and sharing in this meal, the table of showbread. A, you had to be a priest in verses 10 through 13. And it says in verses 4 through 8, it said you had to be clean. It's interesting, this table of showbread was the time when the priest came in to take of this meal. It says, okay, now is the time, folks, as you're coming in to take this meal, if you have something in your life you are struggling with, before you come to this table, get rid of it. Where do you get rid of it? Those horns on the altar. Remember last week? That's where the priest would wipe blood to confess for their sin. You get it? Jesus set up a constant reminder to tell us, do this in remembrance of me. He said to come to the table. But the first thing before you come to this table, he wants to ask the question, do you have a relationship with me? Are you part of the priesthood of the covenant? Have you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? That was the first requirement that Paul laid out there in Corinthians, is you needed to have a relationship with with Christ. So let me ask you here today, as you come to the table, do you have it? Is he part of your life? The second thing that he says is that that is a relationship that must be free and clear. Paul specifically says, this is a time of self-examination, not for me to examine you, for me to examine me. Look at my life, Stare at these emblems and understand Jesus died for me and you know what? This is the time for me to take all of my sin and lay it out before him. The priest did it every single week. We celebrate this supper every single week. Every single week this should be a time and an examination for you. Paul calls it that. He says to look inside of yourself and he even goes to the point and says if you come to this and you've got sin that you can't deal with Essentially what he says, don't take it. Don't come to this table with false pretenses because guess what? It's not about the table. We get obsessed with the table. It's the meal that matters. And that meal is a relationship with Christ. Free and clear and open. It's a table set for two. We're going to do a time of communion, and we're going to do this just a little bit different. Um, Lauren's going to softly play a song, and this is your time. This is your time to begin to look inside yourself and ask yourself, are there any barriers between me and this table? Is there anything between me and God? Is there anything between me and celebrating this meal? 
And if they are, now's your time. You can confess them right there in your, you don't need a priest. You can confess them right before God right there. You can get yourself free and clear. When the song is done, we're going to pause for just a few moments to get our heads in the right space. And then we're going to partake, we're going to pray, and then we will partake of communion. But folks, it's all about the meal. Prepare your hearts to come to the table and consume the meal that Christ left for us.